Hello, everyone. Welcome to our session, uh, Leveraging Evidence, Interdisciplinary Approaches and Material Engineering to Increase Compliance and Obtain Clinical Benefits with Compression Therapy. We would like to thank Ergo for a educational grant. That's Ergo Medical of North America, who's helping support this educational program. I'm John Lantis, a vascular surgeon in New York City. Joining me today is our faculty will be Emily Greenstein, who I think most of you know, who's in Fargo, North Dakota, and Lucian Vlad, who's a assistant professor at Wake Forest uh, in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. They'll be doing more introductions of themselves later. Some faculty disclosures, you can read them for yourself. And a little bit of housekeeping here. Uh, applicable CME staff have no relationships to or disclosures relating to the subject matter on this activity, etc. So what are our goals today? Well, my goals are going to be to review the evidence uh, from various clinical trials and looking at the studies and efficacy of a novel dual compression system for lower extremity venous leg ulcers. We'll discuss the difference in interface pressures between the material and the patient as measured and, and some various studies looking at that. And also uh, you'll hear later from Emily in regards to strategies to improve compliance. And then uh, Dr. Vlad will go through uh, numerous case studies looking at optimizing outcomes with this novel compression system. So with no further ado, let's move on to my portion of this uh, interesting session. So I think most of you who are on this uh, know what compression is. Compression is designed to help return venous blood back towards the heart from the lower extremity. And I think we also are all aware that uh, often if we have a patient go to the emergency room or such, they may end up with a, a long stretch wrap often referred to as an ACE wrap, which of course is a trade, uh, trade name. But if you put that wrap on a person, you could get up to about 18 millimeters of mercury of pressure. A two-layer wrap that is not well engineered might well, might well get you uh, from 18 to 25 millimeters of mercury, and then a three or four-layer wrap can get you up to 30 millimeters of mercury. Dressings are often changed at least once a week and depend on the amount of uh, drainage can be changed as often as three times a week. Also, the wearability of a dressing, how much a person walks, how much they move around, and their own body weight and the size and shape of their legs can all have a significant uh, differential on how much pressure is applied directly to that limb. So for the treatment of venous leg ulcers, variety of compression systems are out there. Um, you want to have compression systems that take into account the goniometry or the motion of the person's foot, the motion of the person's uh, ankle and how they move through space and time. In general, various uh, systems are designed either to work with a person with a normal foot and ankle or a person with a less than normal foot and ankle. And then other systems may be more beneficial for patients who have obstructive pathology. In other words, their venous system is very hard to empty because of previous obstruction or previous clot. So how does compression work? And again, I think probably preaching to the choir here, but compression works by reducing edema. It, includes, it improves capillary filtration by decreasing the actual drainage. So decreasing the pressure in the capillaries as blood and uh, fluid passes out into the soft tissue. There's gonna improve the fluid shift it back into the veins, decreasing the fluid shift out of the veins and improving lymphatic da uh, drainage. In addition, actually increases the velocity within the veins by making the veins more narrow and keeps the uh, venous blood from pooling. This in, in uh, addition to this, what happens is you actually decrease the shear stress in the lower uh, extremities. And by doing so, decrease the cytokines that you find uh, circulating in that area. This also will help reduce the inflammatory mediators. And actually by decreasing the lumen size of the arteries, you get increased velocity of arterial flow. And at times, you can actually get better oxygenation just by reducing the edema in the lower extremities. But you do have to be careful not to put on a compression dressing 
in a patient who may have arterial occlusive disease that is significant. So multi-layer bandages come in various fashions. The standard or oldest uh, discussion we have, and I'll mention this in a moment, is the quote unquote Una boot or Una's boot, which is Dr. Una, of course, from Germany in the 19th century. But that's often applied somewhat incorrectly as a paste dressing and then just a long stretch or ace wrap. But there are systems that have two layers, three layers, and four layers. The four layer systems usually have a cohesive outer layer a uh, elastic bandage inside that, an orthopedic wool crepe bandage as the contact layer. And these take into account both static and dynamic pressures. The two layer systems often have a direct contact layer and then some form of either long stretch or short stretch wrap over that. And this could be dependent upon manufacturer or sometimes uh, prescriber's choice. As I alluded to, Dr. Una from the 19th century uh, is credited with, although it's fairly hard to find the literature in regards to this, to uh, having developed a contact layer that was placed directly against the skin, made up of gly uh, glycerin and zinc oxide, and then is covered with a secondary wrap. That secondary wrap, of course, in the modern era is either, as you see on the right-hand side, a long stretch wrap, or a wrap that expands greater than 100% of its length when stretched, or a short stretch wrap, as you see in what would be basically the middle picture here, whereas a, uh, a dressing that when you stretch it, it increases in size less than 100% of its actual length. Multi-layer compression involves having a contact layer, one that touches the skin, a short stretch wrap, and a long stretch wrap. Some of these can be homemade, which our center often does, or they can come in many other forms. Uh, through the various commercial venues. Now, in general, the sub bandage pressure uh, is important, especially depending upon uh, the etiology. And what you see here on the left is looking at a patient who may have uh, poor arterial circulation. If you have a patient with a relatively normal ABI, greater than 0.8, you can use a four layer system. Now this four layer system may be best also used on a patient who is morbidly obese, maybe a patient who has significant calf muscle uh, pump failure with a flat foot, and it's gonna be a high pressure system. Certainly a post phlebitic ulcer that has been shown to be secondary to deep venous uh, obstructive disease will benefit from this higher pressure, but you have to have good arterial circulation. As you move down, as a person's ankle brachial index worsens, you have to be more and more careful about what type of compression uh, you put on that patient. Bill Marston at the University of North Carolina has shown very nicely that you can heal patients with compression with relatively low ABIs, but you have to be cognizant of where and when you're doing this. On the right-hand side of your screen, you can see the various different pressures that are applied depending upon the type of dressing you use. So a four-layer wrap may be very effective at getting a uh, good compression over time. But you do have to look at these also over the length of time that the patient is actually in that wrap. And is it getting changed once a week, getting changed twice a week, or is it getting changed more frequently? The ideal compression system would deliver therapeutic compression and have high stiffness. Therefore, the pressure is generated as effective during mobilization and is well tolerated during rest. So an elastic wrap is often not as well tolerated at rest as a more stiff wrap. You need to permit good anatomic flip, fit. You do not want the wrap to slip. You'd ideally like it to be comfortable. Allows patients to wear their own footwear, which would be lovely, although we often have patients just get bigger shoes. Easy to apply and remove, of course, which makes the staff happy and the patient and require minimum, minimal training to get a com appropriate compression on the patient. And so one of the ways that this has been uh, put out there is definitely by Hugo Parch and his group, who's very well known for this, is looking at pressure, layers, components, and elasticity or stiffness. The pressure depends entirely on the force of which the dressing is applied. So it's nice to have something that would tell you how to apply the dressing. Bandages are always applied with some form of overlap and are therefore multi-layer to some degree by definition. 
Now, should that be circumferential or should that come in a crisscross fashion, et cetera? There's a lot of different opinions and some different data on that. Most modern banjo systems have different types of materials. And then are these going to be long stretches I alluded to or short stretch? What type of material are you going to be putting on that patient's leg? And the patient matters too. The quotation marks are mine. The effect of ankle size on pressure, the larger the patient's ankle, the harder it is to get very good pressure. And you can see on the left-hand side, you'll see that as you get a bigger and bigger ankle, it's harder to get higher degrees of pressure without causing skin damage. Also, do they walk? A higher degree of muscle activity and a greater muscle mass enhances the venous emptying. On a patient who's walking normally with a normal ankle, you can put a very stiff uh, dressing on them because all they have to do is generate good force against that dressing. Conversely, impairments to joint mobility, obesity, and the muscle vein pump are going to make you need to put on more and more elasticity to recreate uh, or reapproximate that calf muscle pump function that helps pump blood out of the leg as the patient walks. No one bandage is right for everyone. One way to think about this is in general, one of the teachings is that a four layer bandage um, or plus a long stretch bandage is good for patients who are obese, have flat feet, have good ankle brachial indices, have post phlebitic syndrome and patients who are non-ambulatory. The short stretch only or more rigid dressing is better for patients with normal calf muscle pump function, less compression uh, than the, for the non-ambulatory. Uh, however, these may lose compression earlier but may be beneficial because they lack the elasticity component for patients with more critical lower extremity perfusion issues. So what goes into uh, to creating the pressure we seek? And this is a fairly busy slide, but really there's the, this has to do with the dressings. There's the physical structure and the nature of the fabric. What's, is that fabric stretchy or is it rigid? How many layers do you put on? And obviously, even if you put on a lot of layers of a stretching material, you end up with a much more rigid dressing. What's the width of the bandage? We all know that if we're trying to put on a, a bandage on a tall person with a large leg, having a two inch wide uh, bandage is gonna be very problematic. Whereas having a four or six inch bandage is gonna be very helpful. What's the shape of the limb? limb? Is it a cylinder or a cone? The techniques for bandaging, the stretch applied to the bandages you bring it on and the skills of the person, as well as the patient's underlying physical activity. The technique matters. So there's a lot, and this is again, a very busy slide, probably more for your reference than for me to read to. But the issue here is depending on the type of material that you're putting on that patient, it can really, there's a real differentiation between what you put on, but also who is putting on that material and how fast they're putting that material on and how much pressure they're applying. So the technique and the material do matter and therefore it's nice to have reproducibility to that application process. There are some generalizations. The Cochrane Review uh, famously in 2012 put out a nice review looking at 22 tr uh, trials and fundamentally is what it took home, the take homes were compressive therapy was more effective than non-compression, higher pressure was more effective than lower, and multi-layer compression was better than single-layer compression. Also, continuing to use compression after the patient healed was mandatory. Now, these might seem like uh, almost absurd generalizations, but this is actually what the data had uh, placed in our, in our hands in 2012. Also using compression after DVT, it has been shown that compression after deep venous thrombosis is beneficial. However, how, how beneficial that is. Intermittent pneumatic compression can be beneficial for some of these patients, especially if they have open ulcerations and there are a variety of publications about that. But again, there's not as much data as you may think, but it is safe after deep venous thrombosis and in most cases actually necessary. There is a new Cochrane review that is yet to be released, but this is fundamentally what it's looking at. It's gonna be looking at uh, two component systems, four component systems, inelastic systems, and it's gonna be comparing these or putting these in categories where the pressure gradients are 14 to 17 millimeters of mercury, 18 to 24 millimeters of mercury, and 25 to 35 millimeters of mercury. So 
they're going to they're sort of taking some arbitrary levels of pressure, but that gives you a sense of how the Cochrane review is trying to break this up for the care of our patients. So what are the compression guidelines? Multi-component uh, compression bandage systems. Uh, there's grade two level B evidence. Compression with patients with arterial who have arterial insufficiency can be done, but grade two level C uh, evidence, and you have to be very careful about that. And what about inter intermittent pneumatic compression? Again, only grade two level C evidence. So we have a long way to go to get a very nice evidence core for these types of compression. Interestingly, this was uh, the uh, recent uh, paper taking a look at patients who are normal, 47 females uh, with a BMI that was normal, very low for us in the United States and ankle circumferences that were normal. And the level of significance of values was very different about what got obtained. But after applying compression bandages, definitely the pressure at the ankle was more reproducible, uh, but that decreased significantly but it was also very differential based upon who placed it and how fast it was placed. So again, a lot of differentials just, and this again was in patients who had normal body mass and a normal ankle size. So we're not perfect at putting these things on. Another study taking a look at 32 nurses who were experiencing compression using a particular dressing. And in this case, they used a novel uh, dressing when we're talking, going to be showing more cases and samples of today versus Pro4 versus the Attico system. And interestingly, if you take a look at the reproducibility of applying these systems uh, to see who got the best compression system, that DCS system that you see on the top left hand side was reproducible at about 44% of the nurses placing it of getting the correct values. And if you look over to the right-hand column, values between 30 and 50, which would be your goal values, there was a reproducibility in these 32 nurses of being able to put on a system 85% of the time correctly, which is a nice benefit. There was the Odyssey study, which was again, looking at this uh, two layer system compared to the Pro4 system and looking at the standard of care, looking at 187 patients at 37 centers and the idea was to show non-inferiority to pro four. So two layers, how fast that could be applied, uh, looking at that, et cetera. And in general, the ergo uh, system or the, the novel system that we're discussing uh, performed equally, if not slightly better than the pro four system as it was validated, which again is a four layer system. So a two layer system is certainly equal to a four layer system in this particular study. Also looking at this, the wound area reduction was uh, very significant and improved in both groups. But again, uh, the wound area reduction greater than 40% was larger for the two layer system than the four layer system. So again, showing at least equivalent, equivalency, if not slight superiority, although not uh, necessarily statistically significant. However, on the other hand, how fast you can put on two layers and the ease of, of application was much uh, more uh, uh, preferred, if you will, by the practitioners for the two layer system, as you see here. The two layer system went on very nicely. It was uh, noted to be easy in most cases, and there was a significant difference in the ease of application in applica uh, for the practitioners. And this is really taking a look at uh, the overall take home from the, the study, the Odyssey study. These two similar groups of uh, patients with a similar profile and condition, uh, the two layer was just as effective as the four layer, easier to apply, and it was more comfortable for the patient during the day and the night hours. And I think with that, we will move on to our next uh, speaker. Thank you very much for your attention. And I look forward to uh, answering your questions later. Thank you, Dr. Lantis, for that presentation. My name is Emily Greenstein, and I'm a certified wound amostomy nurse practitioner at Sanford Health in Fargo, North Dakota. Today, I'm going to talk to you about strategies to increase compliance with compression therapy. So when we talk about addressing compliance, about 60 to 70% of patients are non-compliant due to bandages being uncomfortable. 
They often say that their legs are itchy, they report tightness, some difficulty with application. You might hear itching, they're too hot, they slide down, they bunch up at my ankle. Oftentimes when we use compression therapy, our patients are very reluctant to do it if they've ever used any type of compression therapy in the past. Uh, patients believe that compression therapy is unnecessary and ineffective for preventing pressure injury reoccurrence and significantly related to non-adherence. So basically what's that saying is that many of our patients don't believe compression therapy will help their wounds or help their ulcers to heal. A lot of times I will hear from my patients, well, I got an ulcer, so I took my compression socks off or I can't wear my compression wraps because I have an ulcer and I don't want the compression rubbing on it or my legs are too swollen. I can't wear my compression socks. Uh, one quote that's, uh, kind of a mainstay, or if you think about it in wound care, it fits really well for this in this presentation is, if you think of compliance as expensive, try non-compliance from our former Deputy U.S. Attorney, General Paul McNutty. So when we look at compression, compression has been used to control CVI symptoms despite its acknowledged efficiency, its use among patients remains poor. So what that means is, you know, we have all this evidence out there supporting compression. We know that it's the gold standard for treatment for any uh, venous leg ulcers. However, yet patients are not using or not utilizing this therapy. Uh, Non-use non is widespread. You can see it's among both sexes, all age groups and symptom subsets. It's also for all steep classes. So meaning patients who have um, very minimal ulcers, the varicosities, all the way up to patients who have uh, full thickness of BLUs. The longer duration of symptoms and history of DVT tend to increase stocking usage somewhat. So if you think about that, patients who've had a DVT in the past might be a little more compliant with wearing stockings. Um, I think that's more of a fear factor, like the patients hear that they've had a DVT, so they're going to uh, use these compression stockings. However, even within this subset, we're not utilizing compression stockings or compression therapy that often. When we look at reasons for low usage, there's three broad categories that emerged. There's those that are not candidates for compression, so meaning that they might have mixed arterial disease along with um, their venous disease, those in whom it is ineffective. So patients that it might not be the most effective in or maybe ineffective in are patients that have chronic severe lymphedema. So those are the patients that have that um, super swollen, woody, non-compressible type skin. And then because of their attitudes, that were the reasons that were often stated. So there's the patient's attitude and perception of compression. When patients were asked why they don't want to use it, 30% said they didn't have a specific reason, they just didn't like it and didn't want to do it. 25% said that they, their doctor never told them about the compression therapy. Um, and then you'll see all of the rest of them kind of goes into, they were ineffective, they were too hot, it hurt, it was itchy. They made symptoms worse. I couldn't do it because of my job. Um, patients had all kinds of excuses when it came to why they were not wearing their compression. So how do we address compliance with our patients? A couple of features that have been designed into the Ergo K2 system is uh, a way to reduce slipping. There's a comfortable material at the bottom layer. And then the number one thing that we need to remember when we are uh, talking to our patients about compression therapy or we're initiating them in compression therapy is educating them. So educating them about contributing factors. Um, do they need to be on a weight loss program for obesity? Do they need to go through smoking cessation? They need to be educated about standing on their feet for long hours. What do they do for a job? Um, is there any way they can sit down or any way that they can uh, take more breaks to be off their feet? Also talking to them about controlling their diabetes, about high salt intake, and then reminding them and reassuring them that they need to wear compression even when a wound is present. 
So looking at those features, like I talked about with the Ergo K2 compression system, you can see that um, patients reported better pain control than with previous system. They reported less heat with than previous systems. They also reported um, better control of their dermatitis, better control of itchiness, um, and then just that their overall pain level was better than previously used systems with the Ergo K2 wrap. So now let's talk about comfort. Compression wraps can be applied incorrectly. And when they're applied incorrectly, they can cause severe damage to our patients. As you can see in these pictures above, these are examples of patients who had uh, compression therapy that was incorrectly applied, or they may have had compression therapy that was applied correctly. However, over time, the compression therapy had slid down, creating almost a tourniquet effect around their ankles. So we often see this uh, with a lot of the different multi-layer compression systems. You might put them on the leg originally and they will be in place, they will look really good. However, after a day or so of the patient walking around, um, the fluid shifting, the compression wrap will slide and it will uh, create that tourniquet effect at the ankle and then the leg will balloon up above the wrap. So, when we look at the Ergo K2 system, there are a couple of things that were designed with all of these things in mind, designed to help our patients with to increase compliance. A couple of the things to look at about the unique system is the dual compression with pressure system. So two active compression bandages that together provide that gold standard recommended 40 millimeters of mercury compression at the ankle. When we look at lots of systems on the market, we had heard about um, the short stretch and long stretch in the previous presentation by Dr. Lantis, talking about um, short stretch bandaging is 80% of the pressure. It has, we look at stiffness, comfort, and protection when we look at that. The second layer um, is the K-press layer. So the K-press layer is a long stretch bandage. This type of bandage maintains pressure at rest and holds the system in place. So looking overall at the Ergo K2 system, it has two components, a KTEC or short stretch bandaging on the bottom, which works when the patient is active. It works with calf muscle pump. And then you have the K-press or the long stretch bandage part, which works when the patient is at rest and it holds the the system in place better. So this design allows for the patient to have that optimal compression of 44 or of 40 millimeters of mercury at the ankle 24 seven. So let's look at a little bit of data that's out there. The Beijing study showed a new dual compression system, like I talked about providing that compression 24 seven. The patients were asked to rate their comfort by day and by night. And you can see that the patients who wore the Ergo K2 wrap, they reported 95% of comfort by day and 92% by night. The next study we're gonna look at is the Junger study. This study was an evaluation of 24 patients. They used three different compression systems. After seven days, the um, Ergo K2 maintained an effective therapeutic pressure that 44 millimeters of mercury at the ankle in the supine sitting and standing position. You can see that it was able to maintain resting pressure to ensure comfortable and safe compression. And it was also working and comfortable not slipping when the patients were up and active. Now I'm just gonna go over a couple of cases for you. So this is a patient of mine. He was a 75 year old male. He had several years of bilateral lower extremity swelling and skin discoloration. You could see in the first picture that all of his edema was predominantly in his calf or that calf area. There was hardly any at the ankle. He did have a history of congestive heart failure. He wore regular compression stockings. 
However, when his leg started to swell, he was one of the patients who said, you know, my leg is swelling too much. I can't wear my compression because it hurts too much. It's just too hard for me to get on and off. Um, he also had that chronic venous changes at the ankle that he most sit staining, you can see. He did have a venous duplex done that um, did not demonstrate any significant saphenous vein dilation or insufficiency, and there was no DVT. So as you can see in the first picture, how swollen his calf muscle was, or the area above his calf muscle. And you can see by day seven, his legs start to look normal. And then by day 14, he has almost all of the edema pushed out of um, both of his legs. The patient reported the wraps stayed in place um, very well, that there was no problems with them sliding down. He never had any problems with itching. Um, this is a really good case because you can see how deformed his leg was in the first picture and how far it had come by only two weeks later. And at that point, he was able to transition into um, back into his regular compression stockings. So this is the next case. This is an 86-year-old male. He had a, a venous stasis ulcer on his ankle. He had previously had an ablation of the greater saphenous and small saphenous vein. He had an AVI of 0.96. He had previously tried um, other elastic compression devices. He had had multiple different options for socks. He's had multi-layer compression wraps also in the past. Um, as you can see in this picture, he, uh, we did compress him weekly and the ulcer progressed nicely. We did take a picture of the wrap applied. You can see the pressure indicators on the outside of the wrap um, showing that we're applying the adequate pressure each and every time. And then uh, how well that the uh, wrap did stay in place after the seven days. This is patient three. This is a 77 year old male. He had a left lateral shin ulcer. He of course had the um, usual past medical history, hypertension, peripheral vascular disease, obesity. Uh, he had previously also had an ablation of his small saphenous vein and greater saphenous vein. He also had a perforator in the distal calf, which we had treated. He had previously had um, the multi-layer compression systems. He had also tried long stretch bandages. He had had stockings that he used. Um, he had an awful time keeping different things in place. He would oftentimes report that the dressings would slide down because he was fairly active still um, as a farmer. So you can see when we applied the uh, Ergo K2 wraps to him uh, that we started to see progression in the wound bed as well as um, the wraps were staying up a lot better. The patient did report uh, less pain with it. He was able to still continue to uh, work in his field and um, he reported very minimal itching and overall was very satisfied with the uh, compression wrap. So this is case four. She's an 81-year-old female. She has a history of osteoporosis. Her AVI was 0.97. She also was previously treated with um, different device, different compression options. She was treated with a long stretch wrap, anti-embolism stockings, uh, compression stockings. And as you can see with her, she's one of those ladies that has a fairly skinny ankle to start with. Um, these patients, we often find problems with the development of pressure injuries over their bony prominences. Uh, but you can see with her, she really didn't have any problems with that when we utilized the Ergo K2 wrap. She reported it stayed in, in place really well. And you can see that her wound did progress to healing. So this is KS5. This is a 77 year old female. Um, she had also previously tried almost every compression under the sun. Her ABI was 0.97. Uh, she was started with the Ergo K2 wrap. She had radio ablation of the left accessory posterior greater and short saphenous vein. Um, you can see that her wound progressed nicely throughout the um, couple of weeks. She also reported a decrease in pain. She had said that there was not a whole lot of itching with this type of wrap, that she was able to keep it in place. She was able to wear it at night as well as during the day without any increased pain or um, complaints. 
So we did this case study of uh, 10 patients utilizing the ErgoKey to wrap, and you did see five of those cases. You can see that um, overall compliance was really good with the patients. They rated it very easy to good or easy to good. Um, there was no slippage reported in these 10 patients. They reported general comfort with the use of it. Um, they were happy with the ability to wear footwear. Oftentimes we see with our patients, they'll get these bulky wraps on and then they're unable to get their shoes back on and they have to wear slippers, which puts them at a risk for falls. So um, with the Ergo K2 wrap being a little bit thinner, the patients were able to wear their uh, shoes and uh, were very satisfied with that. Our nurses or clinicians that applied the wraps too, they reported improved skin conditions, decreased edema, and basically just gave positive feedback as well as that from the patients. Thank you, that concludes my portion. I will now turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Vlad, and he's gonna to talk to you about some clinical outcomes utilizing the Ergo K2 wrap. Thank you, Dr. Lentis. Uh, thank you, Emily. Um, I'm Dr. Vlad. I'm a full-time uh, wound care physician at the Wake Forest Baptist in uh, Winston-Salem. I will present uh, some of the cases uh, and experience with the uh, compression wraps here. Um, to give you a background, I'm uh, part of the Outpatient University Center where we have two full-time providers working all the time. Uh, usually um, a doctor and a PA. We do have uh, three plastic surgeons. They each have a half of the clinic. We have four or five nurses and a CNA. In uh, our practice, we have approximately 5,600 patients per month, and approximately a third of those are venous leg ulcers. So we have, we have a fairly high volume of uh, venous leg ulcers that we are dealing with in our practice. Um, um, I like to uh, remind some of the compression therapy mantras, some of the objective we're trying to uh, reach when we use this, this uh, therapy and uh, this uh, treatment. Uh, Multi-layer systems are more effective than single-layer systems. Higher pressures are more effective than low-pressure systems. And inelastic compression is superior to elastic systems. I would like to remember that. Um, Emily has presented some of the issues with compression therapy, uh, some of the issues that cause discomfort, poor compliance, including the sliding down, the increased pain, itching, burning, wrinkling, erosions of bony prominences, macerations of perion drainage. Another issue that I like to point out is the inconsistency application between the staff members. Uh, I don't know if uh, you have experienced this, but in our clinic this has happened a number of patients requesting to have a certain nurse or a certain provider apply their wrap, and they uh, sometimes that would create discussions and you know inconveniences and things of that nature. Um, so Ergo K2 is uh, the two-layer system: the first layer K tack, a short stretch, and the second layer K press that is, is a cohesive long stretch. Uh, we started to adopt this in our clinic in June 2020, and by approximately February 2021, we were using approximately 95% Ergo K2 uh, uh, compression wraps in our clinic. So why are we doing it? Why did we decide to switch? Um, I thought that the biggest advantage was the pressure visual system. That's something I really liked when I saw this system from the get-go. Uh, we do have the padded first layer that is reducing the shearing, uh, is giving additional protection to the limbs. And this is a two layer a system that's non inferior to the four layer system. Cost was a big part of making this decision as well. They decided to transition to this wrap. Um, the pressure visual system, I want to elaborate on that a little more. What I thought it has brought is the, really the consistency between the providers. So even though we have different providers that are applying the wraps from week to week for, for our patients, if they can follow the pressure visual system, they're getting the same therapy. So this has increased our confidence in the target therapeutic of the pressure that we're trying to reach and has eliminated the staff preferences that we were dealing with in our clinic. 
uh, the padded layer, it uh, decreases the pressure over the bony prominence as according to the Laplace's law, it has less wrinkling. I do think it, it causes less sliding. And if sometimes the, the dressings that you choose do not have enough absorption um, of the drainage, then you, you can actually count on this layer to, to provide some of that absorption as needed. Uh, of course, you have two layers, uh, it takes uh, less time to apply and you, uh, you have a non-inferior system to the four layer. So save time and get the same therapy. Uh, I have a lot of respect for Dr. Hugo Parch and the research and the compression that he's brought into the world. And I think this uh, uh, quote from Dr. Parch is very, very true. The main problem concerning compression therapy is the lack of adequately trained staff. Some new compression devices do not require special bandages skill, may replace conventional compression, in, uh, compression material in the future. So one of the uh, benefits of transition to, to the uh, two-layer compression system is the provider education. So all of the nurses in our clinic, they got adequate training on how to apply it, uh, what to uh, look for, and they all got a diploma. And you see this display here in the wall, everybody's proud of their Everybody's proud to achieve a diploma, it's great. <laughs> but uh, uh, no kidding aside, the, 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 edu the provider education, I think is a critical component of making sure that you use the, the system correctly. Just know the tools that you use so you have the, the best results. Uh, I, I really, really love this slide because it reminds me what we're trying to achieve and what is the compression effect. You know, This is the type of slide where the picture speaks more than a thousand words. I actually don't remember exactly what compression wrap this patient had. We were treating him for a venous leg ulcer. And while he's in compression wrap, he had a blunt trauma to anterior knee and he had a very large hematoma that has diffused in a subcutaneous tissue. And you can clearly see the edge of the wrap where the diffusion of hematoma has stopped. And this is basically what compression does for us. It's allowing us to reduce this backflow, this uh, widening down of the interstitial and the venous uh, uh, circulation. Uh, with that, uh, let's uh, go back to um, uh, practical stuff. So uh, I will discuss your uh, patient that we treat in our clinic, 84 year old gentleman that presented um, in one of our sister clinic with a, a chronic low extremity ulceration. He had a medical history of hypertension, glucose intolerance is uh, A1C was six, right in the middle. He had early Alzheimer and uh, traumatic left BKA. So uh, he was diagnosed as a, a venous leg ulcer and was started in compression therapy. Uh, this is how the wound looked like back in July already. Uh, we can tell you the first part of the first few months treating this patient did not go well. Back in August, it's a lot larger. Fibrotic wound bed, slough, rolled raised edges. Uh, you can see very, really advanced uh, um, stasis changes, uh, lipodermatosclerosis and atrophy blanche, uh, stasis dermatitis, flakiness, uh, all of those uh, changes are present. Now, when another month go by, he develops new ulcerations and the previous ones get larger. And uh, the last picture here on the right is all the way back in September. Um, the workup that we did for this patient and starting to treat him, um, of course, we always start with the arterial inflow and he had a normal ABI, his digital toe pressures were normal, he had triphasic wave flows as well in his right leg. His blood counts, uh, metabolic panel was normal, we already mentioned the intermediate A1C. Uh, numerous topical treatments were tried over this time frame from June until October. Um, collagenases, uh, alginate dressings, foam dressings. Uh, uh, he had a few uh, course of antibiotics. We've tried a number of edema wear compression wrap systems. Uh, patient had significant difficulty tolerating any kind of compression wraps due to itching, burning pain, and significant amount of drainage. Uh, we tried uh, even to get him intermittent compression pumps after a couple months of compression wraps. We tried low pressure uh, compression garments as well. Uh, he had difficulty tolerating any of these. So towards the end of September, um, uh, we continue to have uh, very poor progress, uh, increasing size of the wound. Um, and um, we're looking at increasing both 
in area and volume. This is a, a curve that none of the providers that treating patients with chronic wounds want to see. Uh, in spite of all of efforts, we were seeing this uh, worsening over a period of about four months. So at some point we decided that uh, additional workup is needed and a biopsy confirms inflammatory stage dermatitis. However, some changes may suggest pyoderma. So uh, uh, with this in mind, uh, we decided to refer the patient to dermatology. Uh, we continue to have over this uh, entire time frame of four months difficult story in the compression wraps. And the dermatology consult was initiated. The patient was started on prednisone. And we actually have lost him to follow up from our clinic from October 2020 until March 2021 for approximately five months. In this time, after initial uh, higher dose of prednisone, he was transitioned to uh, um, Celsept. He was treated weekly, gentin violet, and Coban, Coban wraps in a derm clinic nurse visits. Um, after, um, um, after this time frame, he was referred back to our clinic, but I was able to plug into this uh, Excel table the measurements of his calf from the previous four months before he was referred. When we have tried this different compression type of wraps, and you can see here at the bottom of the graph, EW, it's Demoair, UB is Uniboot, uh, NA, a couple of weeks, there's no compression wraps that were prescribed. Coban was prescribed a couple of times. And in the last two weeks, we see here UK, there's Ergo K2. And um, where we see sort of like a flat line of the calf and his ankle measurements, we see this nice reduction here in the calf measurements at the end of this treatment period when ergo K2 was prescribed. However, this is the time when we lost the patient to follow up for another five months. We never knew it at that time and I actually didn't know about this reduction when I was doing this presentation, but I've noticed it after I was able to plug all these numbers in. So it came back to us in April after five months uh, with the recommendations to consider uh, additional grafting. However, he had significant amount of congestion in both of his legs, as you can see on, on these uh, pictures. The aspect of the wound was improved. We can see actually some granular buds. There's still some slough and some fibrotic tissue, but uh, he had significant amount of congestions and venous stasis, significant amount of drainage as well. Uh, we can see a downtrend of his albumin levels. Now his A1C is 6.5. He's crossed the threshold into early diabetes. Uh, patient is um, uh, started on this a significant, more uh, frequent compression wrap regimen. For the first two weeks, we started in uh, Ergo K2 that we were changing in the clinic three times a week. After a couple of weeks, we were able to transition to twice a week because his drainage had decreased. In our clinic, we talk a lot about the importance of nutrition and reaching a protein goal. And we have uh, uh, worked with patients extensively to help him to get to one gram per kilogram protein intake. That is a lot harder to achieve than it seems. Also, because of the peripheral raised dilation, I recommended to stop his calcium channel blocker and work with, right, with his primary care physician to seek alternative treatment for his uh, high blood pressure. So um, in the subsequent weeks, uh, we see a significant improvement in the aspect of his wound. This is the one that we started on the left. On the, uh, the, it's decreasing in size, and he had developed another one on the medial aspect. And we can see some of the, uh, in a couple of weeks, we have actually used a texture compression, and it just happens that I got those pictures in those weeks. But the significant improvement of his wound. And we are now seeing this significant and nice reduction in calf and ankle measurements. And correlated with this decrease in the measurements, now we see very nice reduction in the area and the volume of the wound. So he eventually had a, a very good uh, improved uh, granular aspect of his wound. It was feasible for split and a skin graft. He was continued with very adamant compression uh, treatments, but at this point, we were probably doing the compression wraps just once a week and he ended up uh, having a 100% uh, uh, take of uh, skin grafts completely healed after two or three weeks after the, the grafting. Uh, successful uh, uh, case where 
uh, combining different treatments, we're able to, to, to get to a, um, a good result. The second case I'd like to run by you is uh, last order, and it's a probably more common situation that we uh, acknowledge. Um, so this actually I'm presenting as a question to you. Do you actually use compression under a cast? Do you use cast in your practice for diabetic foot ulcers? So what happens is if a patient comes with a diabetic foot ulcer, but he has significant venous stasis like this patient, so he already has a toe amputated. He has two diabetic foot ulcer on a plantar surface on the first MT and also second toe. But if you can see the picture of his limb, he has significant and advanced venous stasis changes with engorgement of his peripheral veins, hemocytic deposits. He actually has two or three plus soft beating edema as well. So uh, the standard treatment for a diabetic uh, foot is offloading using a knee high walker. However, that is problematic in patients that have significant amount of swelling. And a lot of times I find myself in a situation where we need to delay the, uh, the offloading so that we control the edema. So this is a situation where using both of these therapies, so we apply the uh, compression wraps and we apply the cast over the compression wraps. I don't find that this is very common. Usually a week or two will achieve significant reduction in the limb volume that subsequent weeks only the total contact cast is needed. Uh, this is actually basically a pretty good compression system. It's quite rigid <laughs> and rigidity is one of the, the things that we're looking for in a, in a compression wrap. Uh, uh, so I just wanted to run this by you as an interesting um, uh, trick and tidbit. So with this, I'll uh, conclude my presentation. I'd like to uh, thank uh, my uh, uh, co-presenters, Dr. Lantis and Emily. I hope you guys uh, found this presentation uh, useful. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us for this lecture. Um, we will now take some live question and answers. If you would go ahead and type any of those in the uh, Q&A box, which is located at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'll go ahead and start answering some of those. So we do have a few questions that came in. Um, the first one is, um, let me see. When we have patients, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, all right, there's a question about the patients who refuse to wear compression. How do you go about, it, or do, is there any types of tips to talk these patients into um, wearing compression wraps? So Dr. Vlad, do you wanna go ahead and answer that one, if you have any tips for us? Um, that that uh, can be a broad question. Uh, the short answer to that, I think, is education. Um, so it's, it's mainly about educating and making the patients understand what is the pathophysiology, what is the disease process. And that's when they will start to come up with uh, ideas and way to improve it. So it, it is, it is uh, the, the problem with venous stasis is a very, very, very slowly progressing disease. And it's the type of thing that sneaks up on you. It's kind of like you, you watch the grass grow. You can never see grow, but you can only see the effect of it. So that's kind of like what venous disease, venous stasis disease is. So I explained to the patient, this is a process that goes on for 20, 30 years and a slow blood flows. It, it doesn't mean that the, the circulation in the leg is compromised. It's just parts of the skin around the ankles, what we typically call the gator area. And the only way to get the blood flow there, to get the oxygen and the nutrients that the skin needs is to get some speed there. So you try to engage the calf muscle, try to encourage walking, try to, that's why you explain elevation and, and, uh, and uh, the effects of gravity. And you can explain to the patient the gravity, leg hanging down is gonna pull it down. If you elevate the leg up, then you make gravity work for you as opposed to against you. And the other option would be uh, the compression wraps because some of the, the tissues that have been stretched out for so long, now they are, stretched out and even if you bring down the swelling, 
you will not be able to uh, keep the, the the tissue. You don't have usually the elasticity to 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 and the turgor of the skin. So that's why you need the compression wraps. And I also explain the patient that the compression wraps are a prevention method, and they're not good to treat swelling. The the purpose of the stockings is to prevent swelling. When you have a wound and you have swelling, that's when you need the compression wraps and the consistency of these wraps, which need to be 24/7. So you know, I'm turning here into a long answer because you know you can go on and on about education, but uh, but this is this is the 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 key is just explaining this process and trying to to to, to get patients a visual of slow blood flow and move your you move your ankle, um, a calf muscle to get the blood to flow. Right, and I agree with you. Um, I also a lot of times try to bargain with my patients. I'll say, okay, I know right. you don't like this, but give it a week. Let's just give it a week, see how it goes, see how your leg feels, um, and then kind of go from there. All right, uh, the next question, um, is there any specific type of dressing that you use on wounds prior to applying the compression wrap? Um, there's there's uh, so many dressing choices out there. Uh, I think of uh, dressing choice is usually a uh, educated guesstimate of the drainage amount. So if you suspect you have a, a highly exudative wound, you want to pick up a dressing that can handle that. So there's there's uh, there's a number of foam type of dressings out there. Um, if you have a wound that doesn't drain out as much, and usually that happens is the wound gets smaller and towards the, the healed uh, stage, you, you pick up a dressing that doesn't allow crusting and build up of uh, dryness like uh, your Vaseline gauze, zero form, or something like that. So that's, that's kind of how I think about dressings. Just try to figure out how much drainage you have and pick a dressing that will do it. It is it is quite reasonable, especially in the early stages of venous. That's where that's is getting starting is hard to 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 recommend more frequent dressing changes and compression wrap changes in order to control that swelling and the drainage. So if you don't control the drainage, you're going to have peri wound skin maceration and damage and itching and burning sensation and poor tolerance to the compression wraps. And it's actually going to be not intolerance to the compression wraps. It's going to be intolerance to the drainage that comes from the wound. Right, I agree. Kind so, of just back yeah. to those basic principles of wound management, um, you know, keeping a moist environment, controlling exactly. drainage, um, those kinds of things. All right, the next question, um, have you had any issues with unraveling at the foot with the compression wrap? I can personally say I have not had any issues with this one unraveling. I'm not sure about uh, you, though. I'm not exactly sure what you mean by unraveling the foot, but I, I guess I didn't have this issue. <laughs> yeah, they seem to stay on pretty in place really well. Um, all yeah. right, the next question, is it better to DCS compression therapy when a patient continually gets circulation cut off from therapy, like in those pictures that we're showing? Um, so when you have a patient that the wrap is continually sliding down and you're getting kind of that where the ankle's really skinny and then the leg is ballooning up above, um, you have to look at different ways in order to augment that area. So uh, it, whether you're using, um, sometimes I use foam, sometimes I use um, different cotton rolls, different things to make the leg so that it's all a cylinder shape. You don't want that inverted champagne bottle type leg. You want to make everything uh, more of an even cylindrical shape when you're applying these compression wraps. Um, so that will help a lot of times with that. And then uh, other things you can do if the patient is continuing to still have problems with this is have them come back more frequently until you can get their edema a little bit under control. Um, do you have any other? I 100% I I agree with that. I actually tell patients to expect that, and I actually see that as a success. If the wraps are sliding down, it means they're doing what they're supposed to. They're pushing the swelling out of the limb, and that the limb uh, volume and uh, circumference is decreasing. So of course the wraps are sliding down. So the answer to that is more frequent dressing, more frequent wrap changes, and that's what usually needs to be done at the beginning of starting compression therapy. Once the limb has been brought down, it, the wraps will be able to stay on for an entire week, and uh, that probably may take a week. It may take three weeks or so. Great. Uh, we have time for like one more. Um, this one says, 
Okay. Um, what do you do when you have problems with patient compliance coming from providers outside of the wound care clinic saying they don't uh, they don't need the compression? So I'm guessing for an example, you have a patient that as a wound care provider, you're telling them they need compression, they need this, and then they're going back to their PCP and their PCP is telling them, well, you really don't need compression. So how do you deal with that? Uh, that's that's a that's a hard one because I I I get that all the time as well. Uh, I don't have as many uh, situations where the the PCP says it doesn't need the compression, but uh, they don't they don't understand the importance of it, and they don't. I don't think I I very rarely have seen a PCP diagnose venous stasis. They just send the patient to me for a leg also, but they, it doesn't even cross their mind that it's a venous stasis. So. Uh, uh, it comes down to the, I think the first question that I that I answer uh, is the education. You 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 can explain the patient venous stasis and venous stasis is a clinical diagnosis. Everybody is looking for an ultrasound to confirm it. Most of the times you you don't have a confirmation with the ultrasound unless it's at a way too advanced of a stage with post thrombotic syndrome and uh, severe reflux. But a lot of times all you need is clinical exam. If you see venous stasis, you see apicaratosis, flakiness, itching, you got venous stasis. And so, you know, you explain to the patient the pathophysiology is a slow process. This is the this is the available options: elevation, increased activity, compression. And this is why your PCP has sent you to me to explain you this. So, so you know, you, you know, patients, you know, is basically an informed decision here. I agree, definitely. It all comes back down to education. All right, so that is all the time we have for questions and answers. Thank you all once again for joining us for this presentation.